I thought I was too smart to be a Christian. I mean, it's crazy. I thought Christians were all dumb or ugly. That was not my sense of things. Uh, in the Bible, it's totally different than every other religious That's book. That's right. The Bible is a survivor through time and through persecution. Through many, many attempts to destroy it, it still survives. What are some of the most common misconceptions about Christianity? Well, I guess one of them is that they think of Christianity starting 2,000 years ago instead of seeing the larger picture. Mm. Christianity obviously is about Christ, but Jesus didn't just drop out of the sky somewhere into a theological vacuum. Uh, you go back to Genesis chapter 3, and we see the hints of a savior or a rescuer that's going to come in the future. And then as time goes on and God works through the nation of Israel, we see the setting being uh, laid out for the time when the rescuer, the Messiah, the savior of the world would, in a certain sense, land. And when you look at the birth narratives, you see all of these statements by everybody from Zacharias uh, of the, to uh, John the Baptist's father to uh, the, the angels and what they say to Mary and what they say at the birth of Jesus and to that scene in the uh, temple when Jesus comes. All of these statements that are made about this child are tied to this long history. Unless you see the long history, mm -hmm. you, unless you see the big story of reality the way I Describe yeah, I love that. that. I love that title. How, how the world began, how it ends, and everything important that happens in before, between. Unless you see that continuity, um, you'll understand the basics about Jesus, but you won't see the elegance of the entire story. Mm. And I think, Kirk, the elegance of the story, how it all fits together in a powerful way, is one of the strongest evidences that Christianity is true. It, it makes sense as a story, and it, by the way, this is a true story, it's not just a story, it's the true story of reality. But it also helps to see how the problem of evil makes sense in our story, it's part of our story. It starts in chapter three, it doesn't get solved until 66 books later. It helps make sense of why Jesus is the only way, simply he's the only one who solved the problem. What problem? At the beginning of the story. So all of these pieces fit together in a powerful way and I think that is one of the most elegant defenses of Christianity how the story fits together. And that's what a lot of Christians don't understand. Before you were a Christian, Greg, what, were, what was your perception of the Bible? Was this just a book full of rules like it was for me? I saw it as this book written in an old English translation that made no sense to me. I couldn't yeah. understand why anyone read it. I, I, had, I had very little awareness of the Bible. I was raised in a quasi-Christian environment. Then when I became a teenager in the mid-60s, I just uh, let it all go and I moved past all of that. And uh, my basic perspective was I thought I was too smart to be a Christian. I mean, it's crazy. I thought Christians were all dumb or ugly. That was my sense of things. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I didn't want anything to do with it. Some of and us so fit the bill. The bo <laughs> <laughs> the bo but the, the book that, that they drew their information from, to me, this was a liability. Why are you leaning on information from a book that's 2,000 years old or older and letting someone else tell you how to think instead of thinking for yourself. So my attitude was completely dismissive. Now as I look back, I think, wow, that really makes sense, that really makes sense, that really makes sense, much more than any other worldview can do. Hmm. My view, Christians have reality on their side because we can point to all these things about the real world that people are already aware of that fit perfectly into our story. Greg, what are some of the, the wow characteristics about the Bible? I mean, what are some of the things about the Bible, about the way that it's written, about the content of it, mm -hmm. that, you, that just stand out to you as being unique from other books yeah. and particularly um, bring to life the reality of the world? Well, the, the one I just referred to, and I call this, uh, and others have used this language of it, but uh, it, the unity of scripture, okay? And what I'm referring to there, and I use my fingers on my hand as a kind of memory device, and so the ring finger talks about unity, you know, you think of marriage and the unity of marriage, um, that the scripture is unified in the message it communicates. Now think about this, we have six, 66 books, that are uh, written over thousands of years by people of all walks of life in, in uh, very different perspectives on things who communicate a piece of the story. And in a sense, it's kind of like a puzzle fitting together and they give a piece to the puzzle and they don't know the whole puzzle 
picture, so to speak. They don't know the big picture. They just know this little piece. But when you look through the text and you study it and you see all these different things coming together, all these puzzle pieces that different people have contributed mm. without being aware of the other person's part yeah. over the thousands yeah. of years. They fit together this incredible mosaic that I referred to earlier that comes together in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. So this is a unity that defies a naturalistic explanation. And as I look at this, it, this book, it, though it has individual characteristics by the different authors, it, it, it tells one story. And, uh, and that has a, that to me is one of the most amazing things about the Bible. As given the divine, the, rather the diverse authorship mm -hmm. of all these people over all this time, that they can eat, put together a piece that comes out in the end to show, to show this incredible portrait of the rescuer who turns out to be God himself coming to the planet to rescue us. That to me is really, really powerful. And will you just explain to us the fundamental difference of uh, the way you get to peace with God, the way you get your sins forgiven. Uh, in the Bible, it's totally different than every other religious That's book. That's right, yeah. It's, and I talk about this a lot in the story of reality because what, what happens is we have God who creates human beings to be in friendship with, with him and to share in his happiness. But man gets himself in a heap of trouble. And so then God puts together a rescue plan. You might remember Philippians chapter 2, although he existed in the form of God, he didn't regard equality with God a thing to be held on to, but he humbled himself and took on the form of a man, and then not just a human being, but a servant, and then dying the death of a common criminal. So we have this magnificent rescue story mm. that is absolutely unique. Every other religious point of view has man rescuing himself. Maybe God can help, he gives him the guidance, whatever, but ultimately it's up to man. In this case, in our story, with Christ, he is the rescuer because we cannot rescue ourselves. And that's good because when he rescues, he does a complete job. What does it mean to say that the Bible yeah. is God-breathed? Yeah, and you're taking that line from uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3 that it's not just like God had somebody write what he wanted, but that God was so personally involved that it was almost like his breathing th out and breathing through people to write down, okay? And this is where I go back to the hand illustration because I think that there are, there are six points that I could make or reasons I could give that I'll give them briefly here. The question here is what is, what kind of book is the Bible? That's the que question. Is it a book by men about God? That's a possibility. Or is it a book by God to men? Okay, who is the main author? Now, in the second case, it's by God through men to men. But if God is the main author, having a human being involved isn't going to be a problem because God's bigger than their liabilities. So that's the question. Is it a natural book or is it a supernatural book? Okay, and so I look at six different reasons that intimate to me, that indicate that the book is a supernatural book, not a natural book. First of all, pinky, fulfilled prophecy. There's lots of prophecy in the Bible, it's fulfilled. You can talk about hundreds in the life of Christ. Some of them seem a little obscure. You stick with the main ones, you know, Psalm 22. You know, uh, there it looks like you have a man <laughs> repeating from the position of being on a cross, what a crucifixion is like. It's David writing, of course, and that's the psalm that starts, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But then you have all these other things that are going mm. on that are characteristic of an execution that doesn't even come into existence until 700 years later and wasn't practiced by the Jews anyway, only by the Romans. Uh, you have a prophecy in Daniel chapter nine that you, you could work it out almost to the day when Jesus makes his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Okay, I'm just grabbing two. Yeah, prophecy. There's lots and lots. Of, Prophecy fulfilled prophecy. That's not natural. That's supernatural. Okay, I talked about the unity of Scripture. Yep. Okay, defies a naturalistic explanation. Okay, that's the second. The third one I also intimated. That is the big finger reminds me that it answers the big questions in a way that's consistent with our perception of reality. It resonates mm. with our deepest intuitions. We know something's wrong about the world. We know there's something wrong about us. So a philosophy that says, no, there is no right or wrong in the world, that would be secularism. It's just whatever we want, you do you. That can't be right. 
that doesn't match up to reality. So you have this supernatural insight, I'm oh. just gonna call it, that's the third one. Then you have index to history, index finger, and that is that the, the this, in the Bible, God intervenes in history. So he leaves his mark. The big issue, nation of Israel, Old Testament, the Exodus, etc., and the occupation of the land and all that. Well, there are ways of testing that just from a historical perspective. That's right, archaeology. Archaeology and, and all of that. And then you have, especially in the life of Christ, you have the ancient historical records we call Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but not just them, there's a bunch of others too right. that make reference to it. Now, this particular point doesn't prove that the Bible's divine, but it shows that insofar as it's reporting on what happened, we have good reason to believe that it's accurate. And what it records is a record of supernatural events, especially in the life of Jesus. Mm. And that goes to the issue of the resurrection, which is another topic. But So we've got the index of history. Then we have thumbs up, you know, gladiator, lives, changes lives. Lives are transformed as a result of following Jesus. Yours is an excellent example and publicly mm. known, okay? But billions, literally, of other lives radically, supernaturally transformed. You put them all together, those five, into a fist. And this reminds me that the Bible is a survivor through time and through persecution. Through many, many attempts to destroy it, it still survives. Now, these are six reasons, all right? Prophecy, unity, big questions, index to history of supernatural events, changes lives, survives through history, that are all good reasons to indicate there's something more going on than human beings just mm. writing a book.